Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Web AV Talk series. It's 14 September 2021. And it's my pleasure today to have Anis Costalari from the USA to come and give presentation uh, on uh, her work today. So Anis has acquired her PhD in France in 2014 in skeletal muscle stem cell and vascular biology. She completed her postdoc at Mayo Clinic, and since March 2020, Anis is an assistant professor of medicine, as well as an assistant professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at Mayo Clinic. So her emerging independent research program includes the biology of EVs in liver fibrosis, the signaling leading to the release of pathogenic EVs, as well as their role in recipient cell. So today, her talk is titled extracellular fascicle in liver fibrosis. So before we start, I'd like to thank Horiba Scientific for uh, supporting this session. Uh, I'm very happy to share uh, my work, what has been published as well as um, some unpublished data that a study that is ongoing uh, and which will help uh, hopefully uh, to get another grant. So uh, as you have uh, seen the title, I work on extracellular vesicles and I work on liver fibrosis. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I also have an introductory <laughs> slide. Uh, so I got PhD in 2014 uh, in uh, France, Univers Université Paris-Est. Uh, and then I came here at Mayo in 2015 as a research fellow, during which I got a small uh, postdoctoral award from the American Liver uh, Foundation. And uh, then in 2019, uh, I got the um, American Association for the Study of Liver Disease, ASLD, Pinnacle Career Development Award, which enabled uh, in some way uh, the beginning of my trajectory towards independence. Uh, during, uh, in 2020, during uh, this award, uh, I was promoted to associate consultant, which is a, uh, a staff position here at Mayo, uh, as well as uh, assistant professor. I got uh, the title assistant professor of medicine. And um, in 2019, uh, I also got uh, what Mayo gives, it's a, um, uh, a pilot and feasibility award for the for my ongoing work, uh, which was which is sponsored by the NIH, uh, more specifically NIDDK. Uh, and uh, this year, I got the our uh, Regenerative Medicine Minnesota grant, uh, which is unrelated to extracellular vesicles and which was more um, a team effort grant. And this year, I was also promoted to. Assistant Professor of bi uh, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. So this, um, what I'm going to uh, to present to you um, is um, some published data, as I said, and also some unpublished ones, which will serve uh, later into 2022 for my next grant application. And hopefully they can be published. So this is an EV uh, group. Uh, I'm not going to, um, to introduce uh, the EVs a lot, uh, but for those who are students, if there are any students or any um, uh, new people to EVs, uh, so extracellular vesicles or EVs are released by, uh, in principle, any type of cell. Um, we have discovered, scientists have discovered that they are important for cell-to-cell -cell communication. Uh, there are, from, from healthy cells, there are two types of EVs that are released, uh, microvesicles from the budding of, a, of the plasma membrane and exosomes from, um, uh, which originate uh, from the multivesicular bodies or late endosomes. And now I'm going to give a little bit more information on liver and liver diseases. Uh, extracellular vesicles have been uh, shown to be important uh, in health and also in liver diseases. They are, um, many studies uh, have been um, published um, on uh, injured hepatocytes, EVs, monocyte EVs, injured endothelial cells, EVs, 
uh, activated hepatic phthalate cells, as I, as I will show later, uh, EVs also injured cholangiocytes, uh, cholangiocyte EVs. Now, what, are, what is liver, liver disease? Liver disease, to give you a really broad uh, information about this, um, this, is, this is a healthy liver without fibrosis. But if we consume alcohol, um, a lot of alcohol for a long time, if we uh, eat um, Western diet, and um, unfortunately, if people get hepatitis, um, viruses, well, this injures the liver. And uh, the liver, the injured liver starts to scar, to, to tend to regenerate. So this scar formation, uh, in principle, is to, to be good, it's good. I, but um, if the injury continues for a long time, then the scar, becomes um, more and more important. So the fibrosis goes from initial to intermediate to advanced stage. Uh, during these stages, the fibrosis can, is reversible. However, when we get to cirrhosis, uh, it is not. And we have liver failure and we have liver cancer and people die from liver cancer because it is bad. So uh, we are trying investigators uh, in hepatology, they are trying to figure out uh, how to reverse this. Um, if we get a peek uh, into the microenvironment uh, in the liver uh, during liver fibrosis, we can see that compared to a healthy liver here, where we have hepatocytes, which are form 90, 95% of the liver. We also have these little capillaries that are called sinusoids uh, in the liver. Uh, so these are the endothelial cells. Uh, and between the endothelial cells and hepatocytes, we have what we call hepatic stellate cells. And they are a type of, a very specific type of pericytes. So these cells that uh, go around the endothelial cells and stabilize them. Um, in these capillaries. Now, if we have liver injury, these stellate cells, uh, they become activated um, and they produce a lot of extracellular matrix, such as uh, composed mostly uh, of collagen. Uh, they also produce fibronectin and all other count, kinds of extracellular matrix proteins. And this scar here becomes more and more important, as I said, until we have uh, cirrhosis. So hepatic stellate cells are the main drivers of liver fibrosis, and this is a dogma today. Um, the two most potent drivers of hepatic stellate cells activation, so from this stage to this stage, are PDGF and TGF. So the aim of all what I will present is to study the mechanism of the release of EVs from these activated hepatic stellate cells and to find out the role uh, of these EVs in liver fibrosis. Uh, so don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me during my talk. Uh, I'm okay with it. So first of all, what we did is we characterized the hepatic stellate cell-derived extracellular vesicles. We use here um, mostly differential ultracentrifugation. Uh, so we, we did 10 minutes 300 G and then 30 minutes 20,000 G uh, to get the 20 K uh, pellet and then uh, two hours and a half 110 or 120,000 G uh, to get the uh, small EVs, what we call small EVs. This is just a Western blot, um, just for of cell lysates, uh, the big, uh, large EVs and the small EVs and the EV depleted media. And we can see that is that in this fraction here, uh, the small EVs, we have an enrichment of TSG 101 and CD81 um, EV markers, small EV, let's say small EV markers. Um, 
and there is uh, we could not see any calnexin uh, in this fraction, uh, which shows that uh, there are no uh, cell debris that dead cell debris, and there is also gap DH. And this is just a, a nanoparticle tracking analysis uh, that shows uh, the size of these EVs, and which is about uh, between 120 and 150 for us. And then uh, we started the experiments. Um, so we treated cells with TGF beta or PDGF, and we checked the EV number by uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis. Uh, and we saw that the EV number goes up with PDGF. The, the mode, the size doesn't change. So what we did next is, like, is uh, we checked by proteomics what these EVs, the PDGF-created EVs, uh, what they are enriched for. So we got more than um, 2,000 uh, proteins uh, from the proteomics, where um, 440 between them were at least twofold upregulated. And then after uh, applying a few filters, uh, such as the number of uh, peptide, peptides that were, um, that were detected um, uh, or um, the molecules that were at least uh, twofold upregulated, um, uh, we, we uh, ended up with 56 molecules at the end. And then we ran uh, the um, uh, GO um, uh, enrichment analysis. And we saw that there were uh, several biological processes that were enriched. Uh, and in red here are processes that are um, important for cell migration, such as um, uh, phosphatidylinositol mediated signaling, um, PI3 kinase signaling, uh, MAP kinase signaling, chemotaxis, etc. And three of the molecules that were the most enriched uh, in these EVs, in the PDGF uh, mediated EVs compared to control uh, EVs, were PDGFR alpha, so the receptor of PDGF, SHP2, which is a, a downstream molecule, and, um, and PDGF. Uh, which was probably attached to, uh, is a PDGF probably that we uh, put in the media and it was attached to PDGF or alpha, uh, by, uh, to PDGF or alpha. And then we, um, we did um, immunogold um, uh, electron microscopy, and we saw that, um, and also Western blot, and we saw that PDGF or alpha indeed was enriched uh, in the PDGF condition. As a control, we also checked PDGFR beta, and we saw um, no, no difference, meaning that this enrichment for PDGFR alpha was specific to PDGF, um, to PDGF uh, treatment. And this is, again, in extracellular vesicles, in small EVs. We uh, now on, we used only small EVs because uh, we also checked the large EVs, but we did not see any change in uh, numbers uh, or any change in PDGFR alpha enrichment. Uh, and that's why uh, we continued um, with the small EVs. However, uh, uh, large EVs might have other molecules and might have uh, other uh, roles uh, and we should not uh, forget about them. So uh, then we thought, what is the mechanism leading to this PDGFR alpha enrichment in small EVs? For this reason, uh, we did uh, we generated a few mutants of PDGFR alpha. We know that PDGFR alpha is um, um, RTK, so receptor tyrosine kinase, uh, and it has uh, several tyrosines that are phosphorylated once PDGF binds to it. Uh, they autophosphorylate each other, it's a dimer. So we uh, generated several mutants uh, where we, we mutated uh, the tyrosines to phenylalanines uh, and these phenylalanines cannot be phosphorylated. So there uh, should not be any signaling, even if there is PDGF. And what we saw is that um, compared to wild type PDGFR alpha, 
where we have this enrichment of uh, um, uh, PDGFR alpha in the PDGF um, uh, in the PDGF condition. Here, this mutant here, Y seven hundred twenty F, we do not see this enrichment at all, and this is the quantification of it. We do not see this enrichment, and we thought that maybe this tyrosine 720, maybe this is important for the PDGFR alpha to get enriched into the uh, small EVs. Uh, after checking the literature, we saw that uh, specifically SHP2 binds specifically to the phosphorylated tyrosine 720. So, is there any role of SHP2 in the enrichment of PDGFR alpha in EVs? So first we checked, we confirmed this by immunoprecipitation. So we immunoprecipitated PDGFR alpha. Uh, it's a PDGFR alpha flag tag. We use the flag tag to immunoprecipitate. And then uh, we performed Western blot for SHP2. And as uh, shown here by the quantification, we see a reduction um, of the binding of SHP2 to the mutated uh, PDGFR alpha. And then we knocked down SHP2 by SRNA. And the, in the EVs, we saw that the PDGFR alpha, it is downregulated. PDGFR alpha levels are downregulated in the EVs when we knock down SHP2, meaning that uh, the binding of SHP2 to the phosphorylated tyrosine 720 is important for PDGFR alpha to get uh, enriched in the extracellular vesicles. Now, why is it so important? Uh, are these PDGFR alpha enriched extracellular vesicles important in liver fibrosis in vivo? So what we did is an uh, EV trans, what we call an EV transplant, uh, actually is an injection of EVs. So we utilized wild type mice uh, and we, uh, we generated the EVs from uh, uh, a cell line of hepatic stellate cells that do not express PDGFR alpha or overexpress PDGFR alpha. So this olive oil and CCL4 are the treatment uh, of the mice. Olive oil is control and CCL4 is, uh, or carbon tetrachloride, um, it's a molecule that induces liver fibrosis. Uh, it's a gold standard uh, model of liver fibrosis. And here PBS, MOG EVs and PDGFR alpha EVs are the treatments uh, with EVs. As you can see here in olive oil, in normal mice that do not have liver fibrosis, mock EVs do not um, change anything. However, when we inject these EVs that are enriched with PDGFR alpha, we do see some, um, by serious red, we do see some deposition of uh, collagen as shown here by serious red, the red things here. Um, and then in the CCL4 condition, where we should have liver fibrosis, because this is what CCL4 does, um, this is the control. The mock EVs, uh, they do not increase significantly liver fibrosis. However, when we inject, uh, when we administer uh, EVs that are enriched with this PDGFR alpha uh, into the mice, uh, we do see more establishment of fibrosis. We do see more deposition of fibrosis. And this is the quantification of the serious thread. Uh, we were, when we did this experiment, we were not expecting such big um, change, uh, but this made us think that the EVs are really important and PDGFR alpha enriched EVs are really important. So this is a schematic uh, for this first part. Uh, what we found is that uh, PDGF binding to PDGFR alpha induces a phosphorylation of tyrosine 720, which recruits SHP2. And this complex here is important for the release 
of extracellular vesicles uh, that are enriched with PDGFR alpha. And when we administer them in vivo, uh, they promote liver fibrosis. Now the mechanism uh, here in between, between SHP2 and the release of this EVs, uh, we did not study. And this was uh, the next uh, step. So uh, to study the mechanism, we thought maybe there is, um, maybe there is a, um, a mechanism, uh, maybe there's a degradation mechanism. Maybe the degradation or autophagy is important in the release of the EVs. Um, and that's why we first check the role of PDGF and SHP2 in the autophagy. I'm going directly to autophagy. We also checked um, only lysosome uh, degradation and proteasome, and we got the best results with autophagy. So that's why uh, I'm going to show all the results with it. So um, if we uh, treat our hepatic stellate cells uh, with PDGF compared to zero hours, so to control at the beginning, at four hours, we do see an increase of P62 and LC3B here as compared to zero hours. And this increase in proteins of P62 and LC3B, which are proteins important for autophagosomes, so autophagy, this means that uh, when we have this increase, it means that we have less degradation. And we know that, that we have less degradation because this increase is not due to an increase of the mRNA level, but it is due to a decrease of degradation. So um, uh, PDGF does inhibit degradation uh, by autophagy. And we also checked SHP2 role. So SHP099 is an inhibitor of SHP2. And when we treat the cells with SHP099, we do see a reduction of LC3B. Um, and this is um, also due to a reduction in its um, uh, in, in mRNA levels. So inhibition of uh, SHP2 um, uh, does, um, let's say, does increase um, uh, autophagy. Now, we can say that in this schema that I just showed uh, previously, that PDGF and SHP2 can block autophagy. But do they block uh, the degradation of, for example, MVBs, which, are, uh, which can be at the origin of these small EVs? So how? Uh, I'm not showing it here, but we performed a bulk RNA sequencing uh, to show the role, um, to, to show the, the targets of PDGF and SHP2. And we ended up with one of the top targets, uh, which is RED1. So um, RED1 is known uh, to activate autophagy and to block mTOR signaling. So what we saw here is that uh, compared to control, uh, when we, um, when we uh, treat the cells with PDGF, we have a decrease of SHP2. And we, when we uh, knock down SHP2 by siRNA, we have an increase uh, of this uh, red one. Sorry. So, uh, PDGF decreases RED1, and RED1 then is restored uh, when we knock down SHP2. So we continued, we pursued uh, the role of RED1, uh, the target of SHP2 in EV release. We uh, RED1 was a very difficult molecule to work with, uh, but we somehow, um, we performed this experiment. Um, we overexpressed red one in hepatic stellate cells, and this is our expression. And then we checked uh, the EV release by uh, NTA, nanoparticle tracking analysis. And compared to what we usually see, this increase uh, of EV release by PDGF, we did not see this increase. We saw a decrease 
when we overexpress red one. And then knowing that red one is, is a repressor of mTOR, then we checked mTOR signaling. The role of mTOR signaling in uh, EV release. And this time uh, I'm showing here Western blot of, of EVs from uh, the same volume of media and the same number of cells, normalized to the same number of cells. And we see that again with PDGF, we have an increase of these markers of EVs, CD81, CD63, and ARF6. And we see a decrease uh, when we block mTOR signaling by rapamycin of CD81, CD63, and ARF6. So we can see, say here as a recapitulative, recapitulative, recapitulative schema that uh, PDGF binding to PDGFR alpha recruits SHP2. And then this complex represses red one, which is a repressor of mTOR. So it induces mTOR signaling. And this mTOR, I'm not going to show it here, but um, we published it. This mTOR inhibits the autophagic degradation of MVBs, and it also induces uh, ROC1 signaling. And ROC1 signaling has been shown uh, previously that it was important for this uh, microvesicle, um, microvesicle release. So um, now that we got a little bit more insights into the mechanism and signaling uh, that induces uh, this PDGFR alpha enriched EVs, EV release, then we thought, are these EVs functional? We saw it in vivo that PDGFR alpha enriched EVs could promote fibrosis, but how? And that's why here, I did not animate it, I'm sorry. Here, we performed a, a phospho, um, phosphokinase uh, array, and we ended up with a few targets So the on EVs. So the EVs, when they, when they um, cells that are treated with PVGF, they release EVs that are enriched with phospho FGFR3, phospho ALK, phospho ROR1, phospho TI2. And these molecules um, have been shown to be involved uh, in cell migration. And this, uh, this enrichment uh, was downregulated when cells were treated also with rapamycin, which is an inhibitor of mTOR. Then we took these EVs, the same, cell, uh, the same, same EV numbers, and we treated recipient hepatic stellate cells with them. And we saw that compared to zero hours, we saw that at 24 hours, we do have more migration of the recipient cells that were treated with PDGF mediated EVs as compared to control. Uh, and this migration was, um, was inhibited with, um, with EVs that came from cells that were treated with rapamycin. And this is uh, the quantification. Then we thought uh, maybe we should check again the role of these SHP2 mediated EVs uh, in vivo. So what we did is um, we used um, uh, the recipient mice, donor mice, and recipient mice. The donor mice uh, were transgenic. They were um, SHP2 flux flux, which is a control or SHP2 delta HSCs, where in these mice, uh, SHP2 uh, were, was lacking specifically in hepatic stellate cells. And uh, we took these EVs and we transplanted them into mice, which were treated with olive oil or CCL4. So, um, what we saw is that compared to controls, these are controls, uh, when recipient mice are treated with CCL4 and with EVs that come from normal mice, SHP2 control mice, 
we have an increase of liver fibrosis, as shown here uh, uh, by the quantification of the serious red. But when the EVs come from mice that lack SHP2 from hepatic stellate cells, then the liver fibrosis somehow is reduced, probably because um, these EVs lack these activated uh, phosphorylated proteins that we saw, show uh, with the phosphory uh, in the previous slide. So what we can see here, what we can say here is that uh, these EVs that derive from cells that are treated with PDGF, where PDGF R alpha is phosphorylated and where the SHP2 is uh, recruited, where the mTOR signaling is activated, these EVs here participate or promote liver fibrosis. And now I'm going to show, I don't know if I uh, went a little bit um, too fast, but I'm going to show the, uh, a few results from our ongoing study that are not published. Um, we know that mTOR is implicated uh, in glycolysis, is important for glycolysis. That's why we thought maybe we should check, we should go deeper into the mechanism and into the signaling, and we should check the role of glycolysis uh, in, this, uh, in the release of these fibrogenic or pro-fibrotic extracellular vesicles. And one of the, um, one of the most important uh, molecules uh, in during glycolysis is hexokinase 2 or HK2. So what we did at the beginning is we treated our hepatic stellate cells with no glucose, so just media with no glucose, with one gram per liter glucose or with one gram, gram per liter 2-deoxyglucose. And 2-deoxyglucose it's a glucose that is modified uh, and which cannot be metabolized. It, is, uh, it blocks glycolysis at the HK2 phase. And what we saw uh, in the media is that, as shown here by Western blood, is that we do have a, a big increase of the EV release when we treat cells with glucose, as shown by CD81. And we also show it, uh, I'm not showing it here, but by TSG 101. And this increase, uh, we do not have this increase when we treat cells with the modified glucose. So glycolysis seems to be important uh, in the release of the EVs. We also performed um, a single cell RNA sequencing study for another, uh, for another paper. And I, I just checked um, HK2 in this single cell RNA sequencing. So uh, we performed it on um, one of the cell types in this single cell RNA sequencing was uh, hepatic stellate cell. So we got hepatic stellate cells and then uh, we clustered them in two big clusters um, in a cluster that expresses a lot of collagen that we called fibrogenic and a cluster that uh, does not express uh, collagen that we call non-fibrogenic. And we saw that HK2 is uh, upregulated in the fibrogenic uh, hepatic stellate cell cluster. And more importantly, is, um, when uh, mice are treated with CCL4. So when we have liver fibrosis. Um, and in vivo, what we did uh, for the moment, we utilized, um, we utilized heterozygous mice, HK2 mice. Uh, and we saw that uh, in the control mice, HK2 flux flux, compared to olive oil treated mice, the CCL4 um, induces liver fibrosis, which is normal, we know this. But then this fibrosis is reduced when we, um, let's say, when we delete half of the HK2 from hepatic stellate cells. 
Uh, this is serious red, and uh, we are confirming it uh, at the mRNA level um, by checking collagen 1 alpha 1 and alpha SMA, which are fibrotic uh, my markers. So we do have an increase of these markers uh, in controlled mice, CCL4 controlled mice, and we do have this decrease when we delete half of the HK2 in hepatic stellate cells, which means that glycolysis in hepatic stellate cells is important for liver fibrosis, and it is important for um, probably fibrogenic EV release. So this is, to, this is ongoing, and we are actually, uh, today we just got uh, our, um, the confirmation uh, of our EVs that we can submit them to proteomics, uh, and we should, uh, we shall see what, um, what molecules, what changes do we have in the EVs when we treat cells with uh, glucose or when we treat cells with uh, deoxyglucose or with no glucose at all. Um, so as a conclusion, uh, I think I'll, it's almost time. As a conclusion, uh, we can say that um, here in this mechanism, we are trying to decipher the mechanism of fibrogenic EV release. Um, we actually, currently we wanna know the role of glycolysis in EV release and in liver fibrosis. And we hope to find uh, a therapeutic potential to all this. And as acknowledgements, um, I would like to thank, um, uh, thank you for your attention and also uh, to thank all people that were involved. This is a lab uh, where I belong to. Um, this is my mentor, Dr. Vijay Shah. Um, this is Jin Hang Gao, uh, who participated uh, to the second study. Uh, Bo, who is not in this picture, also participated, but both of them are now back to China. Shalil Kanal is um, a, a postdoc who is helping with the ongoing glycolysis study. Amani Lee also. Shona Cooper helped me with a single cell RNA sequencing and some EV studies and all the rest. I would like to thank the ASLD Foundation for the Pinnacle Award, uh, the NIH uh, and the Liver, American Liver Foundation, as well as Mayo Clinic Center for Cell, cell Signaling in Gastroenterology. Uh, thank you. And I will take any question. Um, yeah, should I stop sharing right now? Or uh, no? Yes, please. Thanks so much, Anis. Uh, wonderful presentations and uh, very comprehensive lecture you give us today on the liver fibrosis and how the HAC play, might play a role through EVs to induce the liver fibrosis. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the questions uh, from uh, Siba Sensei. Please go ahead if you'd like to ask question. Uh, thank you very much. Very beautiful uh, presentation. And my question is, uh, uh, do you know why uh, PDGF induce up, uh, autophagy in uh, uh, stellate cells? So um, what we saw is that uh, PDGF induces the mTOR signaling, and mTOR signaling it is known to be um, uh, to inhibit autophagy. So this is what all we know for the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, we don't have more details um, how it happens, if it is at the autophagosome formation uh, or in another level. We just um, don't know yet. I see. So looks like uh, uh, EVs, EVs from the uh, stellate cells uh, is kind of uh, autophagy-related vesicle. So, such as a uh, amphisome. So, do you know uh, the viscules have have uh, autophagy related markers such as LC three or green one, something like that? So, um, we um, I know other people have found ATG five uh, and other markers um, of autophagosomes into the released EVs. In our PDGF condition, we did not see it by proteomics. Uh, we did not see autophagosomes markers. Mm. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, maybe with another treatment, 
uh, we might see with another condition, but with PDGF, we did not see them. Now, uh, we performed the proteomics um, four years ago. Um, and today, so this time we are going to perform uh, SILAC, which is a, a new, uh, new proteomic technique, uh, mass spec. Uh, so maybe uh, we will have deeper reads. So maybe we might find um, some autophagosome markers. So it's oh, nice. to be considered. Okay, uh, uh, my last question. So, not related to your main story, but uh, uh, in the first, you showed the uh, transferring receptor. Yes. Transf and the uh, apparent molecular weight of the molecule is uh, very higher than the uh, normal. So, do you have any idea? Uh, I've seen that and no, <laughs> maybe a post-translational modification, I would think. Um, I don't know what are the, I'm not an expert on transferring receptor. So um, I don't know what post-translational modifications, but this is, yeah, the explanation that I might give. That okay, is not very helpful, actually. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Aisha Salim, please go ahead with your question. Hi, that was a really interesting talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I have a couple of questions. One is the uh, the PDFGR, is it released as part of the luminal cargo or bound to the membrane of the EVs? And does it matter? Yeah. So I think, so uh, PDGFR alpha, it's a receptor and it cannot be in the media. So it has to be in the membrane. It's a transmembrane receptor. So it is, I think it is on the surface. Um, we have and the EDs. So it's not EDs. like packaged within the EDs. EDs. Yes, okay. yes, yeah, yeah. And I think it is important because um, I don't know how the EVs are uptaken, to be honest. Uh, and I think scientists are trying to uh, figure this out if it is um, um, receptor with another molecule, surface molecule that are interacting, or if actually the EV uh, is giving the membrane to the recipient cell. Um, I, I really don't know, um, but it might be important if the EVs are fusing with a uh, plasma membrane. Uh, and in this case, we do have the whole complex. We have PDGF, PDGFR alpha, SHP2, all bound together. Uh, ready to signal, uh, yeah. so to yeah. induce the downstream signaling. So it may be important, um, yeah, how it is. Mm -hmm. It's so fascinating because there's so many different ways, like you said, of uptake. And if it's fusing, then it, it would be okay if it's a cargo, luminal cargo, but if it's membrane being, you know, uh, being donated to the recipient cell, then it makes sense to have it in the membrane. But it's really cool work. And my second question is about glycolysis. So if, if glycolysis is, is increasing the release of fibro, uh, fibromagenic EVs or EVs that promote fibrogenesis, would inhibiting glycolysis or the vice versa, increasing oxidative phosphorylation dampen that EV release or have you tested this or thought about testing this? Can you repeat the question? Yes, it, I'm kind of thinking of, you know, the, uh, the Warburg effect. Mm -hmm. Cancer cell glycolysis is upregulated. So one mechanism by which you can suppress cancer cell growth and function is to increase oxidative phosphorylation. Kind of applying the same concept here. If glycolysis is increasing EV release, if you suppress glycolysis and increase oxidative phosphorylation, I see. would that decrease EV release? Very good question. I did not check it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, uh, we are going to use oligomycin to um, um, play with oxidative uh, phosphorylation um, and all this cool stuff. Yeah. We did not do it yet. Uh, okay. we, we, we are at the level of performing seahorse experiments right now. Uh, and then with these conditions, we will apply them and check EV release. So thank you. Very cool. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.
Thank you, Aisha. Um, yeah, so I think I think I just have a couple of questions. Uh, one which is like a detail that I probably missed. Um, so you said you treated your mice with EVs. Can you tell us a little bit how you treat the mice? Is it a diet injection or what? Mm -hmm. So it is, um, uh, indeed, I didn't give a lot of um, details, but it is, um, IP injection, intraperitoneal uh, in the tummy injections of EVs of an EV uh, suspension. Uh, so what we did is that uh, we purified, we iso purified EVs, let's say, uh, put them in PBS and right away uh, injected them into mice uh, uh, in IP. Uh, we Cho chose IP and not tail vein. Tail vein would be the best, uh, but we chose IP because we did everyday uh, injection uh, during four weeks because four or six weeks because the um, the CCL4 model of fibrosis is a four, six or eight week model. So we had to inject every day. And uh, it was, if I injected for four weeks every day, uh, through the tail vein, it would have been uh, destructive um, to the mice. So that's why we that's why we were skeptical at the beginning. Um, we didn't really did not know if it would work. Uh, but actually, the EVs really go into the liver, uh, even through IP. They are small enough to go to the liver. Um, so um, that that was good. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um... Have you have you think about uh, doing in vivo imaging to see that? Yeah, so we did um, we did uh, we we did not do um, the intravital microscopy. We did not do that. We did not have that technology here. Uh, but uh, what I did is that I um, we injected flag tag EVs, so EVs that has a flag tag. Um, and uh, we performed immunostaining uh, of the flag. And then we saw there that everywhere. Um, we also did PKH uh, staining, labeling, but sometimes, sometimes it's not good enough because uh, the dye can go from the EVs to the cells or uh, we can precipitate the dye with the ultra centrifugation or, you know, it's, uh, we also did that. We also saw, the PKH positive EVs in the liver, but the flag tag was a, a, a better way, uh, a more rigorous way to, to see the EVs in the liver. So yes, we do see dots of the, 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 the compared to um, compared to uh, PBS um, PBS control. Yeah, yeah, I haven't really thought about how the EV can cross the tissue barrier from the IP injection. That's actually quite interesting. <laughs> it is. And <laughs> yeah. actually, um, the viruses, uh, the liver is uh, it's very easy to work with regarding when you inject things, because everything goes to the liver, because it's a, a detoxifying organ. So the viruses, when we inject them, we inject them, we can inject them IP, and they can go to the liver too. So they just cross the barrier, and I don't know how, but they just cross it. And uh, I don't know if they are transported by something, but they are small. And EVs are like viruses; they, they are small enough to to go there. So this is the beauty of working with liver. Yeah, yeah I can see that. It's quite, quite interesting. Um, and uh, another thing is, um, I'm just curious about uh, what your solution in terms of therapeutic application based on your research. Um, would you consider sort of like inhibiting secretion yeah. to inhibit liver fibrosis or something like that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I would think that um, inhibiting, I think that this mechanism that I showed, it's not important only for EV release, of course. Uh, I mean, there is never something that is important only for one thing. Uh, but one of the, one of, um, one of the um, uh, readouts was EV release and uh, one of the effects was EV release and fibrogenic EV release. So 
if we block this mechanism, uh, I would think that we can block the, 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 the disease, not only through the, what we know about the signaling, not only through blocking mTOR or blocking autophagy or blocking something else, but also through blocking uh, the, um, how can I say, the, these EVs that can go everywhere. So I see the EVs like a wave. Uh, they are secreted by some cells that they reach other cells uh, further and further and further. And this progression, we can block it by blocking the mechanism. Yeah. Mm. Very, very interesting work, Anis. Thanks so much. Mm. Thank you.